Om Namo Narayanaya. Welcome back, as today we read the final chapter, chapter 19 of Canto 1 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, technically, this ends this book, but the books of the Srimad Bhagavatam are not individual things. They're, you know, they, they are one complete story. So, while we're ending this book, the story will pick up in the next one. I, I guess it would probably be like reading uh, the Lord of the Rings series or, um, uh, you know, the, the Gunfighter by Stephen King. We're not ending the story here. It will continue. We're just ending, ending uh, one thematic focus. I have actually no idea where the story goes. I really have no clue. I've never really sat down and read about what each canto is about. So I'm delving into this literally for the first time. But here we go. Final chapter. And uh, thank you for joining me on this. And yeah. Chapter 19. The appearance of Shukadeva Goswami. Sutta Goswami said, While returning home, the king, Maharaja Parikshit, felt that the act he had committed against the faultless and powerful Brahmana meditating in his cave was heinous and uncivilized. Consequently, he was distressed. He thought, due to my neglecting the injunctions of the Supreme Lord, I must certainly expect some difficulty to overcome me in the near future. I now desire without reservation that the calamity come now, for in this way I may be freed of the sinful action and not commit such an offense again. I am uncivilized and sinful due to my neglect of Brahminical culture, God consciousness, and cow protection. Therefore, I wish that my kingdom, strength, and riches burn up immediately by the fire of the Brahmana's wrath, so that in the future I may not be guided by such inauspicious attitudes. While the king was thus repenting, he received news of his imminent death, which would be due to the bite of a snake bird, occasioned by the curse spoken by the sage's son. The king accepted this as good news, for it would be the cause of his indifference towards worldly things. Maharaja sat down firmly on the banks of the Ganges to concentrate his mind in Krishna consciousness, rejecting all other practices of self-realization because transcendental loving service to Krishna is the greatest achievement, superseding all other methods. The river carries the most auspicious water, which is mixed with the dust of the lotus feet of the Lord and Talasi leaves. Therefore the water sanctifies the three worlds, inside and outside, and even sanctifies Lord Shiva and other demigods. Consequently, everyone who is destined to die must take shelter of this river. And thus the king, the worthy descendant of the Pandavas, decided once and for all, and sat on the Ganges bank to fast until death and give himself up to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, who alone is able to award liberation. So freeing himself from all kinds of associations and attachments, he accepted the vows of a sage. At that time, all the great minds and thinkers, accompanied by their disciples and sages who could verily sanctify a place of pilgrimage just by their presence, arrived there on the plea of making a pilgrim's journey. From different parts of the universe there arrived great sages like Atri, Kyavana, Sharadavan, Virgu, Vishvamitra, Angira, Arava, Kavasha, Maitreya, and many, many others, including the great personality Narada. There were also many other saintly demigods, kings, and special royal orders called Arunadayas from different dynasties of sages. When they all assembled together to meet the emperor, he received them properly and bowed his head to the ground. After all the rishis and others had seated themselves comfortably, the king, humbly standing before them with folded hands, told them of his decision to fast until death. The king said, Indeed, we are most grateful of all the kings who are trained to get favors from the great souls. Generally, you sages considered royalty as refused to be rejected and left in a distant place. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the controller of both the transcendental and mundane worlds, has graciously overtaken me in the form of a Brahmana's curse, due to my being too much attached to my family life. The Lord, in order to save me, has appeared before me in such a way that only out of fear I will detach myself from the world. 
Brahmanas just accept me as a completely surrendered soul, and let Mother Ganges, the representative of the Lord, also accept me in that way, for I have already taken the lotus feet of the Lord into my heart. Let the snake bird or whatever magical thing the Brahmana created bite me at once. I only desire that you all continue singing the deeds of Lord Vishnu. Again, offering obeisances unto all you Brahmanas, I pray that if I should again take my birth in the material world, I will have complete attachment to the unlimited Lord Krishna, association with its devotees, and friendly relations with all living beings. In perfect self-control, Maharaja sat down on a seat of straw, with straw roots facing the east, placed on the southern bank of the Ganges, and he himself facing the north. Just previously, he had given charge of his kingdom over to his son. Thus, the king sat to fast until death. All the demigods of the higher planets praised the king's actions and in pleasure continually scattered flowers over the earth and beat celestial drums. All the great sages who were assembled there also praised the decision of the king, and they expressed their approval by saying, Very good. Naturally, the sages are inclined to do good to common men, for they have all the qualitative powers of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, they were very much pleased to see Mahanaja, a devotee of the Lord, and they spoke as follows. The sages said, O chief of all the saintly kings of the Pandu dynasty who are strictly in the line of Sri Krishna, it is not at all astonishing to see that you give up your throne, which is decorated with the helmets of many kings, to achieve eternal association with Lord Vishnu. We shall all wait here until the foremost devotee of the Lord returns to the supreme planet, which is completely free from all mundane contamination and all kinds of lamentation. All that was spoken by the great sages was very sweet to hear, full of meaning, and appropriately presented as perfectly true. So after hearing them, the Maharaja, desiring to hear of the activities of Lord Krishna, congratulated the great sages. The king said, O great sages, you have all very kindly assembled here, having come from all parts of the universe. You are all as good as supreme knowledge personified who resides in the planet above the three worlds. Consequently, you are naturally inclined to do good to others. But for this, you have no interest, either in life or in the next. Ah, trustworthy Brahmanas, I now ask you about my immediate duty. Please, after proper deliberation, tell me of the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances, and specifically of those who are just about to die. At that moment, there appeared the powerful son of Vasyadeva, who traveled over the earth, disinterested and satisfied with himself. He did not manifest any symptoms of belonging to any social order or status of life. He was surrounded by women and children, and he dressed of his, as if others had neglected him. The son of Vasyadeva was only sixteen years old. His legs, hands, thighs, arms, shoulders, forehead, and other parts of his body were all delicately formed. His eyes were beautifully wide, and his nose and ears were highly raised. He had a very attractive face, and his neck was well-formed and beautiful like a conch shell. His collarbone was fleshy, his chest broad and thick, his navel deep, and his abdomen beautifully striped. His legs were long, and his curly hair was thrown over his beautiful face. He was naked, and the hue of his body reflected that of Lord Krishna. He was blackish, and very beautiful due to his youth. Because of the glamour of his body and his attractive smiles, he was pleasing the women. Though he tried to cover his natural glories, the great sages present there were all expert, and so they honored him by rising from their seats. Maharaja Parikshit bowed his head to receive his chief guest, Sukadeva Goswami. At that time, all the ignorant women and boys ceased following Srila Sukadeva, receiving from respect from all. Sukadeva Goswami took his exalted seat. He was then surrounded by saintly sages and demigods, just as the moon is surrounded by stars, planets, and other heavenly bodies. His presence was gorgeous, and he was respected by all. The sage, Sri Shukadeva Goswami, sat perfectly pacified, intelligent, and ready to answer any question without hesitation. The great devotee, Maharaja, approached him, offered his respects by bowing before him, and politely inquired with sweet words and folded hands. O oh, Brahmana, by your mercy only you have sanctified us, making us like unto places of pilgrimages. All by your presence here is my guest. By your mercy, we who are but unworthy royalty become eligible to serve the devotee. Simply by remembering you, our houses become instantly sanctified. 
and what to speak of seeing you, touching you, washing your holy feet, and offering you a seat in our home. Just as the atheist cannot remain in the presence of Lord Vishnu, so also the innumerable, invulnerable sins of a man are immediately vanquished in your presence. O oh, saint, O oh, great mystic, Lord Vishnu, who is very dear to the sons of King Pandu, has accepted me as one of those relatives just to please his great cousins and brothers. Otherwise, without being inspired by Lord Krishna, how is it that you have voluntarily appeared here, though you are moving incognito to the common man and are not visible to us who are on the verge of death? You are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I am therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons, especially for one who is about to die. Please let me know what a man should hear, chant, remember, and worship, and also what he should not do. Please explain this to me. Powerful Brahmana, it is said that you hardly stay in the houses of men long enough to milk a cow. Sri Sutta Swami said, The king thus spoke and questioned the sage, using sweet language. Then the great and powerful personality, the son of Vasudeva, who knew the principal's religion, began his reply. And that is the end of Canto 1. And that answered my question of what this book is about. Essentially, Canto 1's the prologue. It sets the stage for the story. And the philosophy and uh, path of life that has influenced countless people. Wow. Now we're really getting into the juice of it. <laughs> is this a cliffhanger ending? I don't know. Anyways, there we go. Canto 1 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. As I've said in other videos, and to clarify again, this is not a reading books on tape. That's not what I'm trying to do here. This is trying to worship the Lord. I, Lord, I see reading this a form of education, also a form of puja, a form of honoring the Lord by reading about his pastimes and sharing that reading with others. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't a book on tape. That's why I always interrupt it with my own ramblings. Um, so I, I've also do these ramblings to spark a conversation. So it's not a sermon. It's just digesting things and responding to things and looking for your thoughts and comments. Um, this is not a scholarly approach. That would take so much time, and there's so much in this that could just be digested for forever. And uh, it's just to read these things, because I really feel that people don't read them. I actually saw a scholar online who said, no reason to share like what I'm doing. Just just study the book. That's what you need to do, because cause the books are available online. They, they've been shared already. But I meet so many people outside of maybe ISKCON gurus who have actually not read this book. They, very few people I know have actually read all 12 volumes of the Srimad Bhagavatam. They've read bits and pieces of it or parts of it, but to actually read the whole thing, they haven't done it. So I, so when a teacher says, oh, just study it because it's already been read because it's out there, just because something's out there doesn't mean it's read. For example, Tolstoy's War and Peace has been in publication for how many years, but how many people do you know who have actually read it from start to finish? Probably very few. But yet you probably ever so often hear someone mention Tolstoy, but have they actually read it? No. So I think we do need to read these things. We encourage each other to read these things. Now, obviously, this is the translation by Srila Prabhupada, but this is not the big version that you can buy from any ISKCON store that has his purport. Uh, I deliberately did not want to read that, not because it's bad, but because it can be difficult to read because you read the story and then you read this dialogue that goes in all these other places and then you read the story and then the dialogue. And it disrupts the narrative of the story. And the way I like to approach this is we read the Srimad Bhagavan, then we go back and look at the look at the purport. That's how I do his uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. Just read the Bhagavad Gita straight, and then I go back and I digest the purport, just to get the narrative in my head, and then we do the study. You know, it's funny also, I know a lot of people who actually have a copy of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sorry. Bhagavad Gita as it is, all these BH words. And they've not read it. They've literally not, they flipped through it, they went, oh, this is long, and they've not read that. So you haven't even read the Srimad, the Bhagavad Gita, yet 
I can't expect people have read this. So if anything, this is getting, this is sharing the word that needs to be shared, maybe encouraging you to dive into things. And uh, wow, anyways, sorry, I don't have a big, big talk to end this with, uh, to end the Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 1 with and some profound statement, but uh, maybe you can find a profound statement for me and put it in the comments down below uh, and like and share and do whatever you want to this video. You can argue with me, you can whatever, and we'll go on and we'll get to the Canto 2 at some point. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for sticking along with me and with this and many other books and pieces of writing that I do, that I share here. All to glorify Lord Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Rama.